Welcome back, everybody. I'm uh, still Richard. This is still Statistical Rethinking. We're in the second week. This is the last week before we go on break for the winter holidays, and we'll resume in January. The schedule is up online. I want to get a lot done this week, though, uh, to build your anticipation for all the wonderful things to come in the new year. Uh, what we're going to do this week is the foundations of what are usually called regression models. And I want to enter into them in a little bit of an unconventional way. So I, I think one of the exciting and frustrating things about being a scientist is that we're always dealing with explanations that are higher in dimension and more complex than what we can measure about things. And uh, I would say that our senses are impoverished compared to the complexity of phenomena we're trying to explain. And uh, a famous example of this in the history of science is, of course, the motions of the planets in the night sky. So I think many of you will recognize what this is. This is Mars doing its dance over multiple days in the sky. Uh, it does a little loop, right? And uh, all of the planets out from us do this. Uh, they do these little dances in the night sky. This is called retrograde motion. And it's actually, it's a really cool phenomenon. It's, all of you are prepared to explain this, I'm sure, as an illusion caused by the joint motion of ourselves. We're moving, and so is the other planet, and we're, both of these objects are orbiting in ellipses around a large hot ball of gas called the sun, and it creates this illusion that Mars is doing a little loop de dance in the sky. It's not. It's moving in an ellipse, and so are we. Um, but the relative velocities of these objects can create these <coughs> illusions. Uh, Famously, there's an explanation of, of this motion that doesn't invoke that, but invokes something way more fantastic and interesting, and it's called geocentric motion, or the geocentric model. Uh, usually attributed uh, to an Egyptian uh, astronomer, Claudius Ptolemy, and uh, who lived from 90 uh, to 168. Uh, lots of people developed these models. He just published a big you know, compendium of them. And, uh, <coughs> these models are really accurate. Uh, they're really incredible scientific accomplishments, and they predict uh, to within very small fractions of an arc where the planets are going to be on particular um, nights. Uh, they're they're full-blown mathematical models. Um, now, of course, they're also wrong, right? If <laughs> you can find the planets in the sky with these models, which is what they were built to do, but what you cannot do with these models is get a probe to Mars, right? <laughs> so they do not predict where Mars is in the solar system. They predict where it appears to be in the sky. Uh, and this is like a regression model, is what I'm going to argue. Uh, regression models, like the geocentric model, um, are incredibly accurate for particular purposes. But they're also deeply mechanistically wrong. Uh, and you have to keep that in mind when you use them. And this won't be an argument not to use them. It'll be an argument to, again, keep in mind the small world, large world distinction. So let me build this up a little bit by flattering the geocentric model a little more, right? I mean, if you want to do insult to scientists, you might say that they you know, are like a geocentric person. They have a geocentric view of a matter. And that sounds like an insult, but actually that means they're very sophisticated. They have an incredibly elaborate uh, approximation engine that can predict where things are exactly. Um, the reason that the geocentric model works so well is that what, the, what Ptolemy and others had stumbled upon uh, is a very general system of approximation, what we would now call a, a Fourier series. Uh, you could, and what they used is a series of circles embedded in circles, what were called epicycles. And you can see them on this slide. Uh, this is a very simplified, um, reduced version of the Ptolemaic model. Uh, Earth kind of in the middle, but not quite. That, that's required as well. You can't exactly be in the middle. It's weird, I know. but uh, And then a, a planet like Mars is orbiting uh, the Earth, um, and it's orbiting another circle. Its orbit orbits, right? Uh, and you can embed circles on circles on circles and have epi, epi, epi cycles as well. And the more of these circles you use, the better approximation you can get to any cyclical function. Uh, and this is called a Fourier series, and it's actually used a lot in the applied sciences to create functional approximations to anything that is, has periodic behavior, like an orbit. Uh, anything. And you can get any quality of approximation you want, you just need more circles. And this is why the geocentric model is so good. It's still good. Uh, anybody here who's been to a planetarium, that's a geocentric model. 
right? You're still in the middle of the room in the planetarium and the sky is moving, right? You need, you need the Ptolemaic model to build the planetarium. Uh, this is how these things work. So we're, we're not here to build uh, models of the solar system. That would be fun, <laughs> but uh, uh, we're going to build models of many diverse things. And we don't use Fourier approximations typically, uh, but we do use another kind of approximation, these things called linear regression models. So this week I'm going to build up from the foundation as if you knew nothing about regression. I know all of you know a lot about regression actually, uh, but I'm going to start over again and build it up in a different fashion. And um, I want you to keep in mind that linear regression models are incredibly useful. They, they're capable of describing and predicting lots of things, but the, if you use them without wisdom, that's all they do is describe the data you feed into them. Uh, and then they'll make terrible predictions. You can't get your probe to Mars right, with a model that you don't understand causally. So some of the delivery there is going to have to wait until the new year. Uh, the material this week tells you the structure of a basic regression model. When you come back in the new year, we'll do more complicated regression models. And in particular, uh, how you interpret them causally, given that really they're description engines. That's all that statistical models can do is describe things. And then there's extra scientific information you need to make causal inferences from them. Uh, so with that looming over us, uh, let's think about just describing what a linear regression is. So. Uh, these are simple little statistical golems that model how the mean of some measure changes when you learn other things about cases. So you model the mean and variance of some normally distributed measure. I'll have examples of this in a moment. Uh, and the mean is always modeled as some additive combination of weighted variables. And typically we assume there's a constant variance, but you don't have to. If you want to change that, I can show you how to do that too. Um, I'm going to put Papa Gauss here. Uh, there, there used to be um, a much more interesting form of money in this country, <laughs> I think. And uh, you could use it to help you cheat on math tests because the uh, 10 mark note actually had the Gaussian function uh, embedded in it right there. I'm sure somebody probably has these at home, right? No, I have one uh, at home that I've collected, right? Um, was it 2001, 2002 when we switched? Something like that. Um, so uh, this distribution is named after Gauss. He didn't name it himself. He didn't come with distribution and say, and this is the Gaussian, right? It's named after him because he did so many ma marvelous things with it. And uh, lots of people have used this before. Um, and in particular, relevant to linear regression, Gauss is one of the inventors of linear regression. Uh, but he had an entirely Bayesian argument for it because this was before the anti-Bayesian movement in the late 19th, early 20th century. Uh, when Gauss was doing math, everybody was Bayesian. Right? And so he has this Bayesian argument for what we now recognize as the normal or Gaussian error distribution plus using ordinary least squares approximation. He was using it to do astronomy because he realized he needed to make some money. So he predicted when a comet would return. <laughs> uh, he was in his 20s or something like that right at the time. Um, so. Uh, these sorts of distributions, the normal or Gaussian distribution, they appear all over the place in nature. And it's a very interesting scientific and philosophical question why that is the case. So let me take maybe five minutes here to try to deliver some intuition about why normal distributions are so normal. Uh, they're all over the place and they arise through very basic physical processes. And then there's also, once you understand that physical reason that, they, that you see them everywhere, um, there are also epistemological or information theoretic reasons that we may want to assume something is Gaussian. Uh, so let me try to get both of those arguments across for you. So um, I should say the first reason that uh, normal distributions are so normal in statistics is that they're very easy to do calculations with. They have lots of really nice properties. They're additive, right? That's one of the things that's really, really nice about them. Um, Every other distribution you can think of is, is in some way less convenient than a Gaussian distribution. It's just how it is. Uh, so it's like the universe is being kind to us that normal distributions are so normal because it's easy to do math with these things. Um, uh, second thing will be that they're very common. Let me try to give you an intuition for that. And then we'll get to the third uh, explanation. So imagine um, a football pitch. Uh, and if I were to take uh, everybody in this class out to uh, the field and we all line up on the midfield line 
Uh, and ask each of you to take a coin out of your pocket and flip it. And then the rule will be if you catch it and it says heads, you take a step left. If it says tails, you take a step right. So everybody does this, right? And you take some steps. Yeah. And then we do it again. Same rule. If you, you flip your coin again, you catch it. If it says heads, you take a step left. If it says tails, you take a step right. Again. Uh, and again. And we could do this, you know, a few hundred times. Right? And you will scatter through the field in some various ways. And the question is, then, we measure your positions relative to the midpoint line. Where are you on the field? And we plot the frequency distribution of those positions. And what will that distribution be? And I guarantee you it will be almost exactly Gaussian. Uh, and the reason is because this is how Gaussian distributions are born. They are born from adding together fluctuations. Uh, so let me just show you what it looks like in a simulation. And this is all in the start of chapter four of the book uh, as well. This is figure 4.2 in the book. This is a simulation of our soccer field experiment. Everybody starts at position zero, that's the midfield line. You start flipping your coins. Uh, after four flips, four steps, um, I, I don't know, it's like 100. I don't know how many simulated students are on this slide. Apologies. Uh, a large number. Um, and I, the black one is just to trace one particular student. So everybody's oscillating. Sometimes you take a, two steps left and one step right and so on. But a pattern forms in the aggregation. Uh, and what happens even after four steps, you see at the bottom, is you're starting to get this peak with little tails. This isn't really very Gaussian yet. It's only been four coin flips, but you're getting some spread. Right? And then after eight, now it's pretty Gaussian. Uh, and uh, after 16, only 16 coin flips, uh, this is a very Gaussian, a very uh, classical kind of bell curve indeed of distributions. Uh, and it will stay that way. It'll get wider and wider over time. Eventually, you leave the soccer field, right? And move out into the Aldi or whatever this nearby. <laughs> but uh, uh, you never leave the bell curve once you're in it. It just gets wider and wider over time. Um, why does this happen? Uh, there's lots of mathematical uh, theorems that describe this thing. But the intuition I want you to get is What's going on in these processes is that there are lots of little fluctuations. Each coin flip is a fluctuation in your movement. And the fluctuation can be up and it can be down. And in the long run, fluctuations tend to cancel. Uh, and that's why the mean is zero. Because if you get a string of lefts, uh, then eventually you're going to get enough rights that you tend to course correct. Uh, so that the average particle that is student uh, in this example, ends up near the middle. Not maybe exactly at the middle, but near the middle. Uh, I know this is confusing. Another way to think about this is there are lots of different sequences of coin tosses. After 16, the number of possible sequences of heads and tails is very, very large. The combinatorics make you know, thousands and thousands of possible different coin sequences. But a very, very large number of them exactly cancel one another. And in fact, there's no other kind of sum which is bigger than zero. There are more paths that will give you zero than any other kind of path. Uh, I know this is weird, but it's just the combinatorics. And then there are a huge number of paths which give you plus one or minus one. And then a slightly less huge number that give you plus two and minus two and so on. And then falling off in the classic bell curve. And the Gaussian arises as a consequence of this canceling of fluctuations. And anytime you have a process that adds little fluctuations together, Regardless, well, almost regardless, of the underlying distribution, you get a bell curve. That's all it takes. It's just the canceling of fluctuations in the long run. And that's why such a huge diversity of natural systems produce bell curves, because that's all it takes. Genetic systems, you've got a bunch of alleles. They modify your growth. Height is approximately normally distributed. has long tails, but it's pretty normal in the middle, uh, because we don't need to know anything about the actual the architecture of growth or genetics or anything. It's just we need to know that those are little fluctuations. And they tend to dampen one another. And so you get a bell curve from it. Does this make some sense? Yeah? It kind of sinks in after a while. We're going to, in the new year, we'll loop back to this in a later chapter and talk about uh, the, all the other common distributions and statistics also arise through processes like this. But it's not exactly the same as the Gaussian. That's why they look different. But there are processes like this through which some information is preserved in the system through the aggregation process and other information is lost. And what you're left with are uh, particular shapes, which are called maximum entropy distributions. And then Gaussian is the most famous one. 
Um, so the kinds of processes in nature that are going to produce a normal distribution, uh, addition is our friend. Right? And what is addition? Addition is the mathematical function where uh, when you make a composition out of things, order doesn't matter. That's how you define it mathematically. And so any process in nature that makes compositions where the order that the things enter doesn't matter is going to tend to produce bell curves if you have aggregations from them, uh, which I think is super cool because I'm a nerd. But <laughs> this is a really cool fact. One of the things about it that I think is, is nice too is that lots of things are approximately addition. And so you get approximate, uh, really good approximations of Gaussian distributions under a wider range of phenomena. For example, products of small deviations are also approximately addition. Uh, there's a box in the book where I show you how to prove this in the code if, you don't, if this isn't intuitive. Uh, and so there are lots of multiplicative interactions which will also produce bell curves, which is also a neat thing. Uh, and actually, I think I gave a genetics example. I think, it, given what we know about gene regulation, it's probably products of small deviations is what's going on there. It's not that they're additive, it's that they're multiplicative, because um, that's how growth works. Uh, and logarithms of products are, many of you know, addition. Uh, and measurement scales are a human invention. Nature doesn't actually care about them. They don't exist, right? Uh, measurement is an epistemological thing. And so you can measure things on a logarithmic scale as well. And lots of measurements won't look Gaussian on one scale, but will if you take their log. What are logarithms? They're magnitudes. Uh, and magnitudes are just as good as any other measurement scale. Right? <coughs> lots of things are, are more natural to measure on a logarithm scale, like the strength of an earthquake. Yeah. Um, so what I've just tried to deliver to you is a little bit of intuition about what I call the ontological perspective on normal distributions. Uh, there are lots of processes that produce them, and these are the processes which add fluctuations together. And when you add fluctuations, the fluctuations tend to dampen one another, and you end up with a symmetric curve. Even if the underlying fluctuations are not symmetric, which I think is super cool. Uh, there's code you, in the book you can simulate this with. Um, what's neat about this, uh, and frustrating at the same time, is you end up with very little information about the underlying generative process. Once, when you have a bell curve, nobody intuits uh, that that means anything particular about the process that generates it because you know bell curves are common. Right? When you see that heights are normally distributed, that doesn't fr prove or falsify any particular theory about the genetic architecture of height. You learn basically zero about it. Right? Uh, and this is uh, both cool because there's a process by which all that information about the underlying process has been shed. And all that's preserved is the mean and the variance. That's all you've got left. And that's why you only need two numbers to describe a normal distribution, the mean and the variance. That's all the information that has been extracted from the underlying thing. That's all that addition does is it keeps those two moments and nothing else. Um, and I think that's cool. Uh, what's terrible about it is that you can't figure out the process from the frequency distribution. You have to do some science, right? Some harder measurement and figure out more, dig into the depths of it. Um, uh, as a footnote here, uh, this is true of lots of distributions. All the maximum entropy distributions have the same property that lots of different processes will produce the same frequency distribution. And the example I gave last week with the neutral theory and testing whether there's selection or not is exactly an sa example of the same thing. Power laws arise through lots of processes. And the fact that something's a power law tells you almost nothing about the underlying process except that it has high variance. That's really all you learn. Uh, the power law literature is a bit of a mess. Uh, but it's saying that something is, there, you know, you've tested some theory because there, you found a power law is like saying you tested some theory because something is bell-shaped, right? It, it's just not powerful. The other perspective on this is what I call the epistemological perspective. And to some extent, uh, detail of this is going to have to wait until later in the course when we do all the other distributions. And, and there'll be some consilience to this. Um, and I'll give you a proof of what I'm going to say here. Uh, if you're building a model and you want to be as conservative as possible, then, uh, and all you're willing to say about some set of measurements, like height measurements, is that they have finite variance in some mean, uh, then you should use the Gaussian distribution to model them. Even if uh, uh, it turns out that they're skewed or something else, the Gaussian distribution will cover a wider range of values than anything else with the same mean and variance. It's the most conservative distribution you can, you can assume that has that variance. 
any other distribution will be narrower, right? It'll have more information built into it. So this is the most conservative assumption uh, you could possibly make. And so it's a very good assumption to use when you don't have additional scientific information about some measure. It's the right thing to do conservatively. Does that make sense? Uh, uh, I say, I say that expecting the answer to be no, right? Uh, as I said, later on, I'll give you a proof of this later on in the course. And um, all the other maximum entropy distributions also have this kind of property, is that they're the flattest distributions possible given some set of information constraints. That's things you know about the data before you see the actual values of it, like that they're all positive or things like that. That gives you, from that you can derive the most conservative distribution that would fit those measures. And that's, those are the distributions we use in statistics. They're all maximum entropy distributions. And the Gaussian one is just the one, if all you're willing to say is there's a mean and a variance and nothing else, uh, then the Gaussian is the best assumption in terms of being conservative and flattest, right? It assumes the least. It assumes nothing but that there's a mean and a variance. Okay, so let's build some actual models. I've got another half hour here. Um, so I think if you're like me, uh, your early statistics training involved meeting lots of little individual procedures, right? Uh, Chi-square test, I think, was the first statistical procedure I did as an undergraduate. We did some dissections. There, there was still blood on the table. And then we had to do a chi-square test about it, right? Sort of how it worked, right? Um, and, uh, and that's normal. That's how it goes. What I want to do is convince you that basically all of those things are linear models. Uh, and what you should do instead uh, to preserve your own sanity and make yourself more productive in modeling is just learn the, the linear modeling strategy and not worry about all those little procedures. Everything like ANCOVA and ANOVA and MANOVA and all those things are just linear models. Um, T-tests, uh, all linear models. And so we're going to build up linear models from the ground up here. And I'm not going to loop back and show you how to build a MANCOVA or whatever. You don't even need to worry about that. <laughs> it's just this is some procedure that people used to build into software in a particular way. But you can build the model you need for your thing without worrying about selecting from a menu of different options. Um, to ease into this, think back to last week. Here's the, the only statistical model you've seen so far in this course, right? And this is the globe tossing model. And we're gonna uh, write out almost all statistical models in this course in the same standard mathematical notation. This is just a a way of, abbreviated way of communicating to your colleagues what the model assumes. Um, and we're also going to write these in our code uh, so that it gets reinforced. So if, to remind you, in this case, uh, we've got three variables in this model, a count of water observations when you threw the globe, a number of times you, th that's W, a number of times you threw the globe in, and some uh, parameter to estimate, P, the proportion of water on the globe. The little tilde, so we see W tilde binomia. The tilde you can read as is distributed. So W is distributed binomially. That's the data distribution or the likelihood uh, with arguments in and P. That is in trials, each one having a chance P of some success. And then P is distributed. We have a prior distribution uniformly between 0 and 1, which says we put equal weight on all the possible values. Remember? And if you've done your homework already, you've seen the consequence of changing that. Right? You can do better uh, than that. Is this okay? You with me? Remember this? Yeah. So, um, same thing's true for more elaborate models. Uh, and in general, a linear regression model or any model, what you do is you, you've got a list of variables that are going to participate in this model. And some of these are things you will observe, like the toss, uh, the count of water. And some of them are things you can't observe, like regression slopes. <laughs> they're, they're fundamentally not observable entities, right? They're rates, they're things you have to calculate. Uh, or the proportion uh, of coverage on the globe. And uh, so we have to list these variables and then define them. And uh, a linear regression model, just like every other model, there'll be more of these symbols because you could have lots of variables that are participating in the explanation. But it's the same business. You just have to define each of them. And the motor of these linear regression models is the second line in these sorts of things. You don't have to understand this one yet. We're going to build up a simpler one. I just wanted to show you a full-blown uh, example where there's some mean of the normal distribution up top called mu nearly always, and it's got some equation that defines it in terms of some other variable that you've observed. Here, x. 
x is some explanatory thing, right, that will make you famous, right? Because you will show that x predicts y, and it'll be on the cover of science. Yeah. Yes. I'm sorry, I shouldn't be so snarky in the morning, but. Uh, uh, what I want you to notice is at the bottom, I've also said that x has a distribution, because it does. All these variables have distributions. Usually, we don't worry about the dis assigning some distributional definition to the uh, observed variables that we aren't trying to predict. But they do have distributional assumptions to them. And you can, we're going to do some really cool stuff with this fact later on in the, in the course, like measurement error and missing data. Uh, the fact that all the variables have, de have distributional definitions means there's, you know things about them. And if you can put that in the model, then you can get some automatic uh, inferential power that you were missing before. OK, let's do the world's simplest linear regression. Um, and since I, I, I used height as an example before, it's a nice Gaussian variable. There's, let's use height as an example. So uh, these height data come from Nancy Howell's um, now classic uh, uh, evolutionary demography book on the Dobie uh, Hoon. And uh, it's built into the rethinking package. Uh, this is a minimal data set. I've taken away uh, lots of the fun variables. Um, I think there's a Howell too that's got everything else if you're interested. And it's just height, weight, age, and then an indicator whether the individual is male or not. Um, this is 544 uh, individuals. We're going to focus just on height for the moment and just the adult heights and think about how we would build some model to describe the Gaussian distribution of these heights. Um, so uh, here's the uh, distribution of the height data on the right, measured in centimeters in this sample. Uh, and what we're going to do is you say some variable h, which is an in, uh, h sub i, which is the height of individual i, is distributed uh, normally. There we go. Yeah. Uh, the height of some individual h sub i, this is our outcome variable, is distributed normally with some mean and some standard deviation. And there's nothing special, I'm sure you all appreciate this, about these, the particular letters I'm using. These are just conventional. So this mu and sigma are conventional for means and standard deviations. But use whatever you want. It really doesn't matter. The code will not care. Right? Absolutely does not care at all. You're not sinning if you say something else. It really doesn't matter. You'll make a statistician upset and that will be a bonus. Right? <laughs> Feel free to troll the statistician whenever you like. Um, but it's important to have the skill that you can see this thing and you can read it to yourself and say it out loud what it means and that's how you learn what's going on. This is just a language. This is not code. Uh, it'll be code in a minute. But this is not code yet. This is just a form of communication. It's a simplified code for scientific communication. Um, now we've got three variables here, right? One is observed and two are not. So we have to, mu and sigma have not been observed and we have to, we have to infer them from h, from the thing we have measured, right? Uh, but, but mu and sigma still need definitions because this is a, a Bayesian model. Uh, and so they need prior distributions. And we're gonna, I'm gonna assert two here um, and then we're gonna look at what the implications of these priors are. So for mu, we give it a normal distribution with a mean of 178 centimeters and a standard deviation of 20. What does this mean? So this is just the mean mu. This is the central, the, the average height in this population, this Kalahari population. What is 178 centimeters? That's my height. I'm 178 centimeters tall. Well, I'm 178.5 centimeters tall. Okay. That 0.5 is precious. <laughs> 178.5 centimeters tall. So I'm using myself as a prior. Now, this is probably not the best prior because I'm taller than a Kalahari forager <laughs> uh, by a little bit, right? But uh, that's why it's there. And then that standard deviation of 20 is on the mean. It's not on the population. It's on the mean. And that's very generous. And we're going to simulate from these priors in a second and show you what they imply. Uh, and then for sigma, uniform between 0 and 50. This is a, a prior which is way less than probably what we know. Now, now sigma is the scatter of heights in the population. And this prior says, we know nothing except that it's less than 50. Right? We'd certainly know more than that. Uh, let's simulate from these priors and see what happens. Uh, and what we're going to do is what's called prior predictive distribution. We're going to do a lot of this in the course. I didn't do this last week. Last week, at the very end of last week, we did posterior predictive distributions. Right? When you've got a posterior distribution, you can push the posterior distribution out through the mo data model and make simulated observations. You can do that with the prior as well, and this is the best way to figure out what a prior means. Before your model has seen the data, what does it believe? 
It's not what you believe. <laughs> this is what the model believes. You're, you're coaching this thing, right? So this is not p-hacking because we're not using the data. We're, we're designing the model based upon the scientific information we have about the phenomenon to try and build good priors before we uh, use the data to do any educating of the model, right? So um, here's the code to do this. Uh, this is a very simple model, so it's very easy to do uh, the prior predictive simulation. All you have to do is sample values for the variables. So we sample some new values. Our norm is random normal, 10,000 of them, uh, with mean 178 and standard deviation 20. That was, that's the prior for mu. And then we sample sigma from uh, runoff, that's our unif, random uniform. Uh, again, 10,000, between zero and 50. And then we can simulate some prior heights, again, mm -hmm. Height is distributed normally. These are, this is all the same information that's in the mathematical version of the model. 10,000, and then you just put those lists, sample mu and sample sigma, in the slots for mu and sigma. And since R is magical, like lots of these scripting languages, it knows when you give it a list of things, you want that many uh, results in a return. And it gives you that. And then we just plot the density, and this is what you get. Uh, this is what the model believes where you see it. Of course, it, see, it believes that everything's centered on 178, what you're seeing here is not a normal distribution. You probably recognize it as something else maybe. This is a, a T distribution because you have uncertainty about the standard deviation. So you get these fat tails, right? Um, where it is. Uh, what's nice about this at least, it's maybe not the best prior uh, in the world. Uh, there's more biological information you could put into this, but at least we're in the realm of possibilities. Uh, I, what I want to show you though is that there are some really, really tall individuals in this prior. Maybe you don't have a sense about centimeters, but some of these individuals are just absurdly tall, right? But at least we don't have any negative heights, right? There's no impossible people, but some really tall people. Let me give you a sense of this, right? So 200 centimeters is six and a half feet tall uh, for the North Americans uh, in the room. And uh, let me use a different prior to show you why prior predictive, uh, prior predictive uh, simulations are so useful to look at Imagine that I had, I used a much more conventional kind of prior, a flatter prior. So typical linear regression priors are, are incredibly flat. People will put standard deviations on all the priors in the thousands. This is incredibly common uh, in Bayesian statistics. And those priors, I'm going to argue repeatedly over this course, are bad news because they create impossible outcomes before your model sees the data. We can always do better than that. So let me show you an example. Let's take the prior for mu, and let's make the standard deviation 100. So now this is a really, really <coughs> flat Gaussian distribution centered on my height. Uh, but it has a standard deviation of 100. Yeah? Um, if you simulate from this using the code on the previous slide, this is the, the prior predictive distribution of heights you will get now. Still centered on 178, uh, but now there's mass below zero. Zero is the height of a fertilized egg. Right? So we know that everybody in this sample is taller than that. Yeah. <laughs> And that, this isn't cheating, right? I don't have to have seen the data to know this. It's just that I know what height means, right? So whenever you're doing uh, scientific uh, applied statistics, you can use information like that. You want to use information like that. And then I had to look this up, but the world's tallest person ever recorded was 272 centimeters tall uh, at time of death. He was still growing at time of death. He had a very strange, you know, growth malfactor. He just kept growing. And... Cause some anyway, it's a very sad and interesting story. I think there was a movie about it. Um, so uh, that's our natural limit, let's say. We probably don't want a prior that assigns a lot of probability mass above that either. Uh, now, in this case, like in, in most of the examples in the first half of the course, the models are so simple and the relationships between the parameters and the outcome are so simple that you can use really bad priors and get away with it. We're still going to worry about it, and we're still going to do prior predictive simulations, just so we can practice when it's safe. Uh, because in the, once you start working with mixed models, multi-level models, then the priors can have a much bigger effect. Uh, and then you want to worry about it, and you use your scientific information to build good ones, and you'll already be pros at prior predictive simulation, so you feel good about yourself at that point. Okay, we got to compute the posterior distribution for this model. This is the second and last time we're going to use grid approximation. Uh, now it's, this is a two-dimensional problem, so we get a two-dimensional grid. Uh, and we're going to uh, calculate this two-dimensional grid here, mu versus sigma, and in each combination of mu and sigma on some finite grid that we choose, right, we choose how sparse it is, 
we calculate the posterior probability. How do you do that? Um, well, Bayes rule, you multiply the probability of the observed height, right? Conditional on the mu and sigma at that point. Yeah? Times the prior probability of that mu and the prior probability of that sigma. The code to do this is uh, just some loops, and it's in the book. Uh, I encourage you to run it uh, at home, get, make a cup of coffee, and, um, and uh, take a look at it. I don't emphasize this algorithm because we're never going to do it again. <laughs> uh, this is already quite onerous with two parameters. You go to three, four. Um, by chapter six, there's an example with 206 parameters at the end of chapter six. Uh, you don't want to do this that way. You don't have time. <laughs> you really don't. Computers are amazing, but... You know, combinatorics will get you in the end, and uh, you don't want to do that. But I still think this is nice to understand what's going on. So to give you an idea, how the, mind you, there's a grid here. You can do this at different densities of the grid. In the upper left, just a 50 by 50 grid, and you get this very pixelated, right? So this is like crime scene investigation, top board kind of thing, like we zoom in, right, and enhance. Um, starts out fuzzy like that, and then the impossible science computers turns on, <laughs> and then you get, you get extra resolution, and you read the license plate. Yeah, and uh, 100 by 100 now, and you start to see the Gaussian hill, um, and then 200 by 200, and we, the posterior distribution in this case has got a dark area in the center where the most plausible values of mu and sigma lie, and then gradually as you move away from that point, they become increasingly implausible. That is, what do I mean by plausible? The number of ways that you could see these data, Assuming that that mu and that sigma are the true values get smaller and smaller as you move away from that area, that dark area in the middle. Does that make sense? Okay. What we do here, uh, of course, is we draw samples so that we can do summaries because it's easier to think with samples. So, um, again, in the book, there's a, a line of code to do this. Uh, drawing samples is easy. Once you've got the samples, it's just a data frame. You work with it like data. You can, you can uh, make summaries of this distribution. And now we've got fuzzy samples from our hill uh, there in the middle. And if you look at cross-sections of this, right, you imagine that's a, uh, that two-dimensional plot is a hill and we're looking down on top of it. We can look at it from the side. right? If we look at it from the bottom side, you see the contour for mu. That's the shape of the mountain if you're looking from the south. Right, and that's the uncertainty around mu. In the middle is the most plausible value, and then it gets less plausible as you move away. And the same for sigma. If you look from uh, the west on this mountain, you see another contour. Uh, and I don't know if you can see it very well here. I'll, I'll highlight this on a later slide, a couple slides a little better. This is not perfectly symmetrical. The uncertainty, the posterior distribution for sigma is not a Gaussian distribution. Can you see it? This is like, if you don't look at distributions as often as I do. But, uh, it's skewed a little bit. The right tail is longer than the left tail. And this is nearly always true of standard deviation parameters. And, and this is going to be a fun thing for us later on, I promise you. I have a weird definition of fun. But uh, why should this be the case? It should be the case because you know something about the standard deviation even before you've seen the data. You know it's positive. And that's not true of the mean. right? Now, scientifically, you know the mean is positive for height, but the model doesn't know that. You didn't tell it that. But you did tell it the standard deviation is positive because a negative standard deviation is impossible just by its definition. As a consequence, you nearly always have more uncertainty on the up end. Right? You know, you, it's easier to figure out how small the thing is versus how big it is. There'll be many more large values of a standard deviation consistent with the same data than there are small values. And so you get this skew in variance parameters or what are often called scale parameters in statistics. Um, that said, it's pretty close to Gaussian, right? Uh, it's not bad. And the more and more data you get, uh, the more Gaussian it gets. So this brings us to what we're really going to do for most of the course, uh, first half of the course, is use the quadratic approximations. A grid approximation for teaching is really invaluable, I think. And, and you really should sit down with your cup of coffee and run through the two-dimensional uh, grid approximation. Make sure you understand what's going on. Because that's all Bayes is doing, it's just the, that multiplication. But now we're going to do a fancy approximation of it so we can go to higher dimensional models. And um, that approximation will be to assert that the posterior distribution is a normal distribution in every parameter. Uh, and this is often an incredibly good approximation. It's embarrassingly uh, a good approximation, actually. Uh, that said, later on, in the, once you get into generalized linear models, 
uh, it's often a really bad approximation. But for perfectly linear regression, um, assuming the posterior distribution is Gaussian in every dimension is often fine, even for sigma, strangely. Um, how does this work? Uh, you need, remember I said you need two numbers to describe any Gaussian distribution. You need its mean and its standard deviation. The posterior distribution is more than one dimension, so you need more than one mean, right? You need a mean for every parameter, and you need a standard deviation for every parameter, and then you need the correlations among the parameters. So the multidimensional Gaussians have this covariance matrix that you also have to estimate. <coughs> so you need a, all these numbers, but this is way fewer numbers than calculating a grid calculation, uh, a, a grid approximation. So uh, it turns out that this procedure of doing a quadratic approximation, uh, how would you do it? Um, you just climb the hill. So remember the, the hill back, yeah, the hill right here? Uh, your computer can just start at any particular point and then it doesn't know where the peak is, but it knows what uphill is. And so it can just climb uphill through some gradient descent or gradient ascent, sorry. It's usually it's down <laughs> that the computer is doing inside the computer, but now we're climbing. So it's climbing, it's doing gradient descent. Gradient is just a slope, right? I know there are hikers out here, right? You know about ridge lines and things to save your feet. Yeah, so uh, the, the computer knows these things too and it wants to find a ridge line and go up it. And so to find the peak. And it, it'll do this, and, and R has built into it really good algorithms for doing this. You can give it a very high dimensional space, more than two, and it'll follow the you know, n-dimensional ridge line, as it were, and uh, climb up to the peak. And then when it gets to the peak, it just needs to measure the curvature of the peak to know how wide the hill is. And this is all it needs to do algorithmically to construct what we call the quadratic approximation. Um, I put a picture of uh, Laplace here because this uh, approximation is sometimes called a Laplace approximation because he used it. Right, uh, this is an approximation of assuming the posterior distribution is Gaussian, which will be a very, very good approximation under a wide range of circumstances, including when we use uh, linear regression models. Um, note here, uh, if you've done much maximum likelihood estimation, you've done this. So this is a vast majority of maximum likelihood estimates are constructed the same way, except they have no priors. Uh, but the algorithm works probably identically to what uh, the tool I'm gonna show you does. In fact, you could use the tool I'm going to show you to do maximum likelihood. You just got to leave the priors out, right? Okay, what is the tool? In the rethinking package, I have a tool called QAP uh, for uh, quadratic approximation, yeah? And uh, the way um, QAP works is you make these little formula lists which are meant to imitate the mathematical definitions of the models, and you must write every piece of it because I'm annoying, <laughs> right? No, because... Uh, I, may, I may be annoying, but this is for your own good. Uh, you need to own every piece of this thing and learn it. Uh, typically, when you do statistics in a computer, there's some abbreviated model definition form that only involves the measured variables. And so you, you can do statistics for years and years and years and never know the relationship between the parameters and the data, right? <laughs> there's some nodding heads out there. And this is a safe space. You can admit it. It's all good. <laughs> and... Uh, <laughs> Uh, so I wanted to make a teaching tool that had none of those luxuries, and so I did. And that's, why, that's how Quap was born. <laughs> um, and so you're going to have to write uh, every detail of how every parameter multiplies every uh, variable, but then you're going to feel great because you're going to be super confident about what the model structure is, right? Um, so in this case, for the simplest linear model, we take the first line, h sub i is normal, mu sigma, and you can just write this as height is the name in the data frame, the variable is called height. Tilde d norm, d norm is the function in R for the normal density. And then mu and sigma. And there's nothing special about those names, mu and sigma, anything you like, but for communication purposes, I'll, I'll try to keep using mu and sigma. And then we have to define those, give them priors, mu d norm 178.20, and sigma d uniform from zero to 50. That's it, and there's your model. Does this make some sense? These will get more elaborate as we have more variables, but uh, this is the idea. And then you just pass it to Quap and give it the data frame. And then what does Quap do? Um, Quap translates this into a, a, a statement about the log probability of the data at any particular combination of the parameters. And then it passes it to the hill climbing algorithm that's already built into R called Optum. And Optum does all the hard work and passes the answer back. And what is the answer? It's a list of the means and a covariance matrix. And those two things are sufficient to define a Gaussian posterior distribution. Um, and then you can get a summary 
uh, of that using this uh, Pricey tool that's also in the rethinking package. Um, Pricey, I wrote Pricey because the summary command in R, you guys know this function summary, oh god, it's ugly, right? Like nobody with aesthetic sense to find, to design the output from that, right? You've got, you've got variables returned with like eight numbers after the decimal point and just like, and there's p-values everywhere. And it's just, it's abhorrent, <laughs> right? So uh, Pricey is minimalistic and uh, gives you a, a basic summary of each variable's uh, Gaussian distribution. That is its mean and its standard deviation. And then these 89% um, percentile intervals, right? The compatibility intervals defined on percentiles. So there's equal uh, weight in each tail. Let's look at them graphically. Uh, so you can get a better sense of what's going on. So uh, we can also extract samples. Remember, we want to work with samples because it's easier to think. And this will be a case where I can compare this Gaussian approximation to the exact uh, the grid approximation that we did and see how good it is. So extract.samples is a function in rethinking. You give it a, a QAP model um, that's been trained on some data, and it'll do the sampling. Right? It uses that Gaussian approximation it returns uh, a data frame with a column for each variable and as many rows as you like, right? And what are these rows? Well, we'll talk about that in a few slides. Just hang on a second. Uh, the values in the rows go together. But if we just break them apart now and plot each column by itself, on the left, plotting mu, uh, the uh, samples there are uh, uh, the, yeah, blue, sorry, I was looking for my key, it's in the upper right, yeah, <laughs> so the samples are in blue and then the dash part is the actual uh, Gaussian approximation uh, to show you this, uh, how it works, and you'll see that the um, uh, sigma still has that skew, right, in the samples that we had drawn before. The Gaussian approximation is a little bit too symmetric. Um, to understand what this means, we're going to have to draw some lines. And we'll do that in a second. That's the next part. You're like, where's the regression line, Richard? Uh, it's coming. <laughs> we're going to draw some lines. Um, uh, the first thing that I want to say, though, is uh, I think of this tool, I've, actually, the whole rethinking package is a scaffold for you so you can learn how to do modeling um, and actually understand what the models are. After this course, or even during it, uh, it's perfectly fine to use packages which use abbreviated model inputs. But you want to make sure you understand what the model is. And so these tools, like QAP, force you to do lots of really annoying chores over and over and over again. And you're going to hate it, <laughs> right, if you're, if you're a normal person. Uh, but then you'll come to love it. The Stockholm Syndrome will set in. And uh, you'll appreciate the fact, the security, knowing that, like, yeah, no, I know exactly what that model's assuming because I wrote it over and over again because that asshole McElreath made me do it over and over and over again, right? So uh, it's for your own good. And, uh, but it really is just a scaffold. Eventually, you're confident enough of these models that it's perfectly fine to go use some abbreviated uh, model input. Um, but it's really not okay when you're starting out uh, to use the abbreviated input. Uh, it's my opinion, at least. Okay. Um, we're also going to need to think of, of the algorithm, the, uh, the quadratic approximation as a scaffold. It's a thing that helps you learn your way into modeling, but you want to graduate beyond it and stop using it at some point because for generalized linear models, things with non-Gaussian outcomes, it's really hazardous. It can, make, it can do lots of really silly things, and I'll show you some examples uh, in the new year. Okay, let's add a predictor because you want lines, right? When you, when you hear regression, you think a line is coming. There's been no line so far. We've just got some Gaussian distribution of height. Congratulations. Uh, now let's add a line, and that means adding a predictor variable. What is the idea? The idea is there may be other variables in this data set that when we learn them, we can make better predictions about the outcome of interest, that is the height. There's some statistical association between some variable, in this case it's going to be weight, and uh, the variable height. Uh, and again, there's good biology that determines this. This is only the adult sample. I've cut off the kids because it's really different in the kids. Uh, and this is the relationship between weight and height uh, in this population. Right? So uh, I think you, your eyes aren't lying to you. There is a, a statistical association between these two things. But the question is, how would you statistically describe this? Right? Such that you could compare different populations or talk about the relationship across age or any of the other stuff that you would actually do in a scientific paradigm. So what do we do? Well, 
we add another variable to the model, and now we have a linear regression uh, in the conventional sense. And this, this model here has all the standard features, and every linear regression is just this with some of the components replicated. So this is your OOR model, as it were. Um, so again, the top line is the likelihood or the, or the, or the data model. Uh, for height, it's normally distributed. Now there's an I by mu. You see that? It used to just be an I on H. Now there's an I on mu. And that's to say that mu depends upon the person, I, that you're talking about. Yeah? It's different uh, for each person now. Um, and mu I now has a definition. Uh, it's alpha plus beta times xi minus x bar. We're going to spend time on the next slide talking about this. So hang on a second. And then we have priors. Um, and there's a, two of these priors you've seen before. Um, our alpha thing is what mu was before. It's going to be our population mean, right? And this is my height again, 178 centimeters. And sigma is the same as before. But now we have this beta thing, which is describing the relationship between x and and uh, H sub I. So let's take a closer look at the prediction part of this, the real motor. So um, do you see uh, mu I has got this expanded definition now? We've taken something that mu, which used to be a parameter, it's still a variable, but now it's defined deterministically entirely in terms of other variables that we've made up, right? And you're like, how could this be legal? It's like, well, it's science, everything's legal until you're caught. Right. <laughs> and, uh, so uh, it's still a variable, but now the equal sign means it's deterministically uh, defined by the things on the right-hand side. And those things are two new parameters, alpha and beta. Alpha has the same meaning as mu before. It's the population mean. And we're going to estimate it as before, and that's why it has the same prior. Yeah, does that make sense? And this beta thing is uh, the, what you would call a slope. You probably are, are eager to say that. Uh, the rate of change in mu for a unit change in x. Just rolls off the top, I know. <laughs> uh, but it's a mechanistic relationship, right? So if you could probably see if beta were zero, then we're just back to the previous model. We're saying there's no relationship. If beta is a positive number, then every time x goes up by one, mu goes up by that, goes up by beta. Yeah. Uh, we subtract, why there's this weird thing where it's xi minus x bar? Uh, that's so alpha has the meaning of the population mean. Otherwise it won't, right? Uh, so when xi has the value x bar, what happens to this equation? All that's left is alpha, yeah? Because then you get x bar minus x bar, and that whole term <laughs> goes away, and then beta doesn't matter, and then alpha has the meaning of the population mean. If you don't, this is called centering your predictor, and you should always do it. Well, not always. <laughs> There'll be some cases where the meaning of it means you don't want to do it. But this is, should be your default behavior when doing regression, is to center the thing. Uh, it's a really nice thing to do. It makes everything easier to understand. It makes the priors easier to define. There'll be endless examples of this. There'll also be examples where I violate this for hopefully good reasons, and I can justify it for you. Yes, Brett, you have a question? Richard, doesn't that imply that it should say mean when xi equals x bar instead of <laughs> xi equals zero on the far left? Oh, did I write that wrong? Yes, you're right. Yeah, that text is wrong. Yeah, it should be that zero should be an x bar. Thank you. Yeah, the slide is wrong. I was right, but the slide is wrong. Thank you, Fred. All right. Um, prior predictive distributions. Let's do it again. Uh, so we've got priors. We've got a new model. There's this new beta thing in there. It's now predicting lines, though. So what is the prior distribution got inside of it now? And the answer is a whole lot of lines, right? Uh, has anybody here ever seen the movie 2001 A Space Odyssey, right? You get to the, no? Yes, okay, so, okay, you get to the end, there's the monolith, he looks, oh my God, it's full of stars. All right, that's the prior, a prior, oh my God, it's full of lines, right? It's just an infinite number of lines. No? Okay, one person's smiling. <laughs> okay, so, <laughs> in my childhood, that was a very important movie. It was like the beginning of getting into anthropology for me, <laughs> right? So, it's a great movie. So, uh, Anyway, moving past my, my failed joke, <laughs> um, we're going to simulate lines from this thing, from this monster, and, uh, and take a look at what the implications are. And we do it just like before. Um, let's simulate 100 lines, not an infinite number. Uh, set dot seed up there. There's nothing special about that number. This is just so you can repeat exactly my example. Uh, you might want to then change that. So set seed just sets the random number 
uh, algorithm inside R so that you can replicate my examples. And I'm trying to put this in all the examples so you can get my exact pictures back, but there's nothing special. I haven't cultivated this number. It's just whatever mood I was in, whatever I ate recently, I just type a number and I get something. Uh, and uh, then we sample some alphas. You'll recognize that. We sample some betas. Uh, and I'm ignoring sigma because we're just going to draw the mean line. We're, we're just getting the prior for mu. Right? We're going to draw mu. Mu doesn't depend upon sigma. Right? The whole scatter of H's depend upon sigma, but not the line. Does that make sense? Okay. So what happens? Well, this is what you get. Um, with uh, beta D, you find is normal with mean 0 and standard deviation 10. Uh, mean 0 means uh, uh, you expect, your prior expectation is that there may be no relationship between weight and height. Now, obviously, that's scientifically silly, but that's okay. I mean, I don't think that's actually so bad. You're letting the data speak. But getting the scatter right is important here because you'll see in the prior, all these lines that have come out of the prior, there's lots of really impossibly strong relationships. Uh, right? So again, I've drawn my same lines as before. Zero centimeters is the fertilized egg height. Yeah, slightly bigger than zero. Right? If you really measure the fertilized egg, it's slightly taller than zero. Yeah, but close. And then the world's tallest person again, 272 centimeters at time of death. And uh, so some of these slopes are taking you from impossibly short individuals to uh, individuals you know, approaching twice as tall as the world's tallest uh, person. Uh, we want to damp down the enthusiasm of this prior a little bit, right? And again, we've got enough data here and the model is simple enough and the, the relationship between the parameters and the predictions are simple enough that even with this terrible prior, this will all just wash out. You should do this experiment at home. But we practice when it doesn't matter so that once it does matter, we're good at it. Right? Does that make sense? These are safe examples and we still practice on the safe examples where the priors don't matter that much because there will come a time in your life where it will matter. And then you want to have some sense about how to deal with it. Okay. Um, so let's do something instead. And instead of... Uh, of having this normal uh, 0, 10 prior on beta, let's use our scientific knowledge. We know that beta is positive, so let's make it positive. How would you do that in a prior? One of the easiest ways is to use a log normal distribution. What is a log normal distribution? I know many of you know this because you work with them. Um, a log normal distribution is a distribution of stuff that's normal when you log it. <laughs> when you take the logarithm of the numbers, they don't look normal when they're not logged, but once you log them, they look normal. What's nice about this is it means they're all positive. Uh, in, uh, the actual variables are all positive. Log normal variables are strictly positive reals. And that's what we want for the slopes. We want to assume that the relationship between weight and height is positive. Of course it is. Yeah? Uh, that's the thing to begin with. And then we want to get the scatter right as well. So here's my suggestion. The beta should be log normal 0, 1. And uh, the 0 and 1 are the, those are the parameters that describe the log distribution, right? How is this parameterized? I know I should know this, but I think that's right. Yeah, that's, that's the mean of the log. After you log it, that has to be true because otherwise the zero couldn't be, couldn't be legitimate, right? So this is, that's the mean of the log distribution, right? Uh, so that's the mean and standard deviation of the normal, and then the actual variables are the exponentiation of that. And what does this look like when we simulate some lines from it? Well, now we're in the possible outcome space, right? We get, there's still a lot of scatter, and there's the occasional crazy line Right? Because we haven't prevented it from being, it's unbounded on the top. The slopes can still be really big if the data demand it. Yeah? Uh, but they can never be negative. Um, and between the weight down here of uh, 30 uh, up to 65, at least we're in the possible human range. Yeah. yeah. So this is a way better sort of prior. And this is the kind of thing you want to practice at doing. Is use your scientific knowledge to get yourself into a possible outcome space before you put the data in. Does that make sense? There'll be lots of examples of this uh, going on. Okay, I got a couple minutes, so I think we've got time to actually run this model and approximate the posterior. Um, <coughs> I apologize this slide just being a lot of code, but uh, uh, we're just going to focus on the bottom. I just put it all here so you could see uh, how this example gets set up completely from the top where we load the data. These data are built into the rethinking package. Then I slice out the adults, right? I get all the adults, all the individuals who are 18 or above. Right now, of course, in Kalahari, adulthood starts at 12. But, <laughs> um, you know, this is our culturally imperialistic definition of adulthood, right? And uh, then I, I measure X bar, because we're going to stick it down in the thing below. You don't have to, you could do this in the model, but it's more efficient to do it outside. Um, and then I define the quat model. 
I put the list, I just write the list directly into Quap, and this is how we're usually going to work. But you could pull it out and define a separate variable that holds that list and then pass it in if you like. It's up to you. Um, I tend to do it this way. And then let's review the symmetry again between the mathematical definition on the right and uh, the Quap code. Um, let's just focus on the mu line because that's the new bit. Uh, notice that there's not an equals in the A list, there's that arrow. That you may know in R, that's the way assignments used to be done, the way that old people like me still do them, right? I learned R in 1999. I party like it's 1999 still. And uh, second failed joke. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> and, uh, no, literally, I learned it in 1999. It was the first year I used R. And so I have old fashioned habits. So this tidy verse stuff that, that people do, it's all very cool, but, you know. Some of us learned when all you had was, you know, Flint and Tinder. <laughs> so, so we do everything in base. But uh, uh, do that assignment instead of an equals, and then you just type the mathematical expression. And literally, you're writing the log posterior here. The code you enter into QAP is just going to be used directly in R to evaluate the probability of the data at particular combinations of the parameters. And, that's, and then it'll climb the hill. Uh, so you're programming the log posterior, literally. So there's the potential to do crazy stuff here. Right, but you won't because uh, you're skilled. Uh, you will do good stuff. Um, okay, this is a perfect place to stop. I'm, I've run out of my time. Um, I'll advance the slide just so we know where we're going to pick up. When you come back next time, uh, we're going to keep working with this model and we're going to characterize its behavior and talk about how to talk about the uncertainty around the regression line as well as its location. Okay, thank you, and I'll see you on Friday. <laughs>